The part, both in the book and the movie, that always meant the most to me is the part where he's whacking away at that typewriter. I, I actually had an electric typewriter. I, 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 you know, it was the first thing I ever bought with my own money from shoveling, you know, uh, driveways in the winter and mowing lawns and things like that. Um, but I had a whole wall papered with rejection slips. Welcome to this special Labor Goes to the Movies pod extra. As part of the DC Labor Film Fest spring screening series in the AFI Silver's virtual screening room, we showed Martin Eden, Pietro Marcello's adaptation of Jack London's autobiographical novel. We were joined after the film by John Sales, director of labor film classics like Mate One and Eight Man Out, and a novelist himself, including Union Dues and last year's Yellow Earth. John has a lot of insight into the film, not only as a director and writer, but from the perspective of a politically engaged artist. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Moi, je m'appelle Elena. Martin. Eden. Bonjour. Enchanté. Este libro en Taiwán y que es. Más o menos, ¿sabes qué parte solo la primera libro? Yo no me he llamado. Entonces, parlamos en sí. Se van a amigos importantes, una buena recomendación. No te mañana vale ni diciendo la fatiga con ti. Quando scrivi sei troppo crudo. Tu vorresti che io togliessi tutte le cose brutte che scrivo, che dessi una speranza. Quanti ne vedi morire di fame, finire in galera perché sono dei poveretti, schiavi, ignoranti e stupidi. Lotta per loro, Martin. Quello che scrivi non si venderà mai e noi non ci sposeremo mai e non saremo mai una famiglia. Io mi dovrei vergognare di raccontare tutto questo. La signorina è non è proprio per te. Noi potremmo essere felici insieme. Noi non ce lo saremo morti. Welcome, Chris Garlock here, director of the DC Labor Film Festival. Thanks so much for joining us. And wow, <laughs> what a what a movie! Just I, I just saw it with you guys tonight for the first time, so I can't wait to talk about it. Uh, I'm so so pleased that uh, John Sales could join us. John, welcome. Nice to be there. Or uh, so of course, uh, you know our labor audiences know John is the director of you know film classics like Mate One and Eight Men Out. Uh, I was checking, you know, the database, John, 18 films since 1980. And mm -hmm. then I'd forgotten you also directed um, three of my favorite Bruce Springsteen videos, Born in the USA, mm -hmm. I'm on Fire and Glory Days. And then also five novels, uh, including one, I don't know if you can see behind me, uh, Yellow Earth from last year and um, uh, one of my favorite books, Union Dues. And I had reached out to John uh, a while ago to do the intro for this, just because I knew as a filmmaker uh, and as a novelist, uh, I, I just thought John would have something interesting to say about a movie based on uh, a Jack London novel, uh, which frankly I had not read in a long time. Uh, but then I found this quote about from the Times uh, about Yellow Earth, which uh, said that 
Uh, John's ancestry is more like the repertorial vigor of Jack London on one side and a little of the sweet impressionism of Stephen Fr Crane on the other. So, um, so glad you could be with us today, John. Yeah, yeah, nice company. Um, John, just let me uh, get some general reactions from, from you to uh, Martin Eden. Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting things to, to, to think about is um, that w when you make something from a book into a movie, uh, you can either just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move the people around and you're going to get to see the clothes and everything and we're going to be very faithful to it. Or you can say, um, what does that mean to us now? Or what does that mean to me now? Because, you know, filmmaking can be very personal. Uh, the book was written in 1909. That's over 100 years ago. And uh, not that class has disappeared or socialism or individualism or libertarianism have, have disappeared or even changed that much in some ways, but a lot of things have happened since then. And what you see in the, in the movie is the filmmaker, because he keeps the time frame really, where are we? <laughs> the clothes and the everything, it, it, it's basically okay, you know, we're talking 20th, 21st century, you know, maybe 21st century. Um, but he, but he's, he's saying, well, let's include those hundred years of things that had happened. Uh, Jack London didn't get to know about those things. Uh, he didn't see, you know, what happened to the Soviet Union. He didn't see, you know, some of the other kind of political experiments that have gone bad. Uh, he didn't see, you know, at that point he hadn't seen two world wars. Right. And you've seen the first one, which he did survive um, barely, I think, to, to, to see the beginning of the first one. Um, so so that's, that, that's one interesting that you just have to say, well, if you came there and you just read the book, um, this is a very, very different story. You can see it's, a, it's like a jumping, you know, it's like a trampoline and he, he really flies pretty far from it in some ways. The part, both in the book and the movie, that always meant the most to me um, is the part where he's whacking away at that typewriter. And um, I, I actually had an electric typewriter. I, 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 you know, it was the first thing I ever bought with my own money from shoveling, you know, uh, driveways in the winter and mowing lawns and things like that. Um, but I had a whole wall papered with rejection slips. And just like the character, um, I, I didn't know anybody who'd ever written a book and gotten it published. I didn't know really how you went about it. It was kind of like Battle Creek, Michigan, where you sent your, your box stops and they sent you back some black. <laughs> you know, it was just a mystery to me. So it seemed like a world that belonged to other people. And you get a really strong sense of that, both in the, in the book and the movie of the, the, you know, he just sees this is a way out of the parts of my life that I don't, yes, I can win this girl, but also I can, I can transform myself if I can get into that world. He doesn't know anything about it, really. Mm -hmm. He just knows mm -hmm. that he thinks it's a machine that just doesn't even read his stuff. There were all kinds, when I first started writing, of rumors when you send in your SASE, you know, self-addressed stamped envelope, um, about people who would put like a $10 bill in between the pages and see if it was still there, if it came back, meaning mm -hmm. they hadn't really read it. And it was such a big deal if they like put a little card on it that said, sorry, try again. Right, right. Um, so that part I was really, you know, and then the added thing was I at least, you know, my, my parents never read novels much, but they, you know, books were around a little bit. I read books when I was a kid. Um, he's coming from people who don't read books. Right. So it's an even further stranger land that he's going to. Um, and then he, you know, to, to me, the tragedy certainly in the movie is that where he goes, he, he, he loses contact with everything else. And he lands in this strange literary world where basically he's been branded. Mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. that people are really listening to what he's saying. It's just he's this odd, exotic person who, oh, my God, a talking dog, a guy <laughs> from that class. 
in that time who can write, you know, which is less, less unusual now. Um, but in, 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 you know, in London's time, he was really like, oh my God, this guy's not like an egghead. You know, he, he, you know, he didn't go to school to learn how to write, he, you know. Um, and so that, that to me was the, you know, the, the most emotional part of both the, the book and the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and what I also know is that London was very disappointed in the reception of the book. We, we were talking about um, how, when it came out, the people who liked it, liked it for this romantic idea of the writer. Sure. Man of a people becoming a writer. Um, but nobody got that the second part of the book was really a criticism of libertarianism, what we call it today, or in those days, just individualism. Right. Um, and that, so he, he has moved to this little literary hothouse, lost contact with almost everybody else, and he's just lost. Um, and and his, his aggression, which he's always had, just turns outward and inward at the same time. What we were talking about before, before we started this and remind folks of where, uh, well, first of all, that London died young. Uh, and mm -hmm. this, I think, was his last novel, right? I think it might have been. Uh, you know, it's so hard. He wrote so many things. He may have, <laughs> you know, thrown a couple off on, in a, on a weekend. Right. But where where he was when when he wrote this? Where, yeah, he, he he had gotten he was already famous. Uh, he made enough money that he had a boat made for him called the Snark. And he just said, I, I'm just going to get away from everybody. And he went on this. I think it was like a two year voyage where he went to Polynesia and various places. He got various diseases that nobody in the States knew how to. And, it, you know, it helped kill him young. Um, and he was really depressed. And so he was in this bad shape while he was writing this thing. So it was a guy who was feeling in his mid thirties or so, kind of like, is that all there is? Mm -hmm, Here mm -hmm. I am, how come I'm not happy? Um, looking back on taking some of what his young idealism was about, and his young excitement about being a writer was about. I think another thing to, 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 to think about is, um, He's in the United States, he's kind of considered, oh, he wrote those boys books. Right. You know, White those, Fang. You know, those kind of kind of like Robert Lewis, Lewis Stevenson gets thrown into that bag. In Europe and Russia, he's huge. Um, you know, people know a lot of his books there. They've been translated there. And I and his stuff translates fairly well. Mm -hmm. And the plot of them seems exotic and strong and stuff. I think he's one of Putin's favorite writers. Oh, jeez. Uh, I had and, no idea, uh, really. Yeah, uh, be, because all that kind of call of the wild stuff. And the macho you know, stuff. Yeah, the macho stuff and the, you know, survival of the fittest stuff. If you think you're the fittest, you love to read that stuff. Sure. And that's the message you'll take from it. Um, but, uh, you know, it. he was a complicated guy. And then you know, the movie is, it is seen through the eyes of this director and, and he has his own agenda and things he wants to talk about. And he's got, he's got a lot of Italian history to think about and, and, and that he's grown up through. Um, Italy is a country that since World War II, I don't think, you know, they've had like 60 governments, you know, the turnover has been that fast and the people who have stayed have been these kind of Svengali guys like Il Divo, um, you know, who are backroom guys and who just kind of survive and never are the front men. And then you get Berlusconi. Right. Um, you know, this is, this is not a country that is going to make you feel like, oh, there's a way that we can govern people and, and everybody gets what they deserve. So, well, let's talk about that. You know, just I, I was when I was watching it tonight, I was I was thinking about it. You know, uh, you watching it as a filmmaker because mm -hmm. uh, it's a brilliant film technically in so many ways, right? You were telling me it was shot in sixteen millimeter. Tell tell folks what that what's that's about. Why is that important? Yeah, sixteen millimeter is film for one thing, and most things <laughs> are now shot on digital. Um, when you shoot in 16 millimeter, you have to blow it up to 35 right. and that gives it a certain amount of grain. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that has always been associated in people of my generation anyway with grittiness. Right. Um, the you know combat photographers shot in 16 millimeter. A lot of documentaries, uh, 60 Minutes used to be shot in 60 millimeter. Hmm. And it had this kind of, you know, real life documentary feeling to it. And, and one of the things he does that for, I imagine, is that he's also got a lot of stock footage in there. A lot right. of archival footage, which was also shot on 16 millimeter when it happened. And, and they don't bump each other quite as much for that. Um, his choice to make the time not just that moment when Mussolini got in or that moment when something happened in Italy or in the world is, is something that um, allows him to focus on, on the kind of a more eternal stuff. You know, the, you know, this isn't just Italy in 1930, just before they invaded Ethiopia. This is life in a port city. You know, Jack London, it was set in o Oakland, which is not as, you know, there's some great stuff in Oakland, but it's not as, you know, photogenic as Naples, uh, I have to say. Um, <laughs> now, now, no, let's not pick on and, Oakland. <laughs> and, but, you know, so, so there, there is this rawness to it. And he also lets his main, as good as that actor is, who, who plays Martin Eden, he lets him be really obnoxious. Right. You know, he's not an easy guy to hang with. And then, you know, when we see him after his literary success, you know, he's really a mess. Um, and, and when you make that choice as a filmmaker, you're, you're basically saying to the audience, okay, this isn't your usual ride where you, you identify with a main guy and, and you're up you know, on his team for the whole thing. This is one where you have to step back and say, whoa, what's going on here? Well, and before, because I want to get to the politics of it, but let's talk a little bit about the music uh, because uh, I know you, I mean, from your very first, have thought a lot about music. Mm -hmm. I mean, any filmmaker has to, but I, I mean, to me, tell me if I'm wrong, but I mean, to me, your, your music is, is as important as anything else in your films. Mm -hmm. And this guy seems very much in the same and I saw it right from the very beginning because you've got this sort of archival thing going on and I don't know enough about music to know but the music that comes in right at the top seemed very modern and right away you were being it's told. all over the place yeah <laughs> right he's not using it to put you in a time and a place right he's using it for just straight emotion uh people ask me all the time because I'm a novelist and a filmmaker the difference is between the two one of the things that you have to be aware with of when you're writing a fiction is that if you describe things well, you can have rhythm and, and you can kind of do the same scene that you could do in a movie, but it all has to go through somebody's head first. Right. In a movie, there's stuff that bypasses your head and goes straight to the viscera. And music is one of those. I mean, some of the best music people don't even realize they're, they're not aware of it. It's just it seems just part of the movie and cause it's working on them, not through their head. Mm. Um, and so, you know, his, his, you know, I'm sure there are rhythmic reasons that he made some of his choices. There are emotional reasons that he made some of his choices. Sometimes it's working against, you know, sometimes you want the music to underline what's happening and increase it. And sometimes you want to make a comment on it. You know, um, you know, if you're playing Happy Days or here, here again, and you're seeing a funeral scene, you're commenting on it in a way. Um, so he's, you know, he's he's definitely playing with a lot of tools here to to. I think the hard thing about the film is at the end of it, it just seems like okay. Um, if we listen to this guy, socialism is a total waste. But as we see, individualism isn't doing him any good. Um, at all, and nobody's lives have gotten better. And this whole striving thing didn't make him any happier. It didn't even get him the girl. Right. I remember when I was reading the book because there, there's in the in the London book, there's also the kind of working class, you know, girlfriend. And uh, in the book, he's he eventually, even though he, you know he likes her, he's just not in love with her because she's right. not the daughter of the bourgeoisie. Um, he's embarrassed by her rough hands because she works in a factory 
Mm, that's right. That's and right. I remember reading it and I had seen the movie that they made of an American dream of the Dreiser book. And mm -hmm. I just kept saying, oh, I hope he doesn't get her pregnant and, dr and drown her. <laughs> you know? I'm so glad when she at least didn't get killed by him. Um, Cause that was, you know, that was the trope of that time of, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get out of your class, you have to cut those other people, you know, loose. And if any scandal, you gotta get rid of those people who know mm -hmm. about the scandals. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, it, to, to me it was, you know, uh, hard to hang with that guy for me. You know, but he's just not an easy guy to hang with as, you know, at the same time admiring the actor. Um, and, and it's not an easy message at the end of it, you know. And I think if you, if you look at Jack London's life, he had these two things going as well. He had this intellectual idea of, of socialism um, and just a, a, a kind of natural resentment of big anything you know, of the big capitalists. Uh, but he also had this very, very individualistic streak. Um, and he also, he, he kind of felt like going down these rabbit holes of theory was really dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, so he wasn't an ideologue. Um, he was, you know, he's a, he's a complicated guy. Well, and I want to talk about that just a minute before I talk a little bit more about, you know, the socialism, um, uh, in that, you know, talking about how he's hard to hang with, and you know, and and he, London, um, said this was obviously his most autobiographical uh, work, and mm -hmm. to me, it's really interesting that he has it, you know, makes himself this character that is not, you know, you 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 naturally want to identify, you mm -hmm. want. Yeah, but I, I'm with you. There were several times when I was like, especially that moment when he basically, this is, you know his working class uh, mm -hmm. lover, you know, and I mean, that was just incredibly painful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, you have to also remember the time that he's in and where he's from. Um, Jack London was not a proletarian who worked in a factory. Um, he was basically a wild on the streets teenager who was an oyster pirate. <laughs> he used to raid boats and steal oysters. You know, he's a criminal. Um, and his kind of work experiences would have pointed, if he hadn't become um, uh, a writer, he probably would have ended up being a wobbly. What? Uh, a wobbly. A wobbly, right, right, okay. You know, those, those, you know, those were you know, itinerant laborers. They were lumberjacks. It's a very, very different thing than being in that factory setting, feeling the iron heel, you know, right on top of you every day, walking into a building. They're, you know, they're looking at their watches every second and you you really are a cog. He was mm -hmm. aware of those people. Mm -hmm. He hadn't really lived that life. Um, I think, you know, the, the person he reminds me the most of is Joe Hill. Yes. Um, you know, the romanticism, the writing, but also this kind of rough and tumble guy who's a little bit of a criminal. Right. A little bit of a criminal, a little bit of a, you know, and, but, and, 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 you know, always moving on. Right. Always, yes. yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's talk some about, you know, this, you know, it's, it's, it's very much a, a, a book about class. It's very much a movie about class. But as I think you've been talking about it, it's in particular this filmmaker, I think, and I don't remember enough about the novel. It's a long time since mm -hmm. I've read it. Um, so I don't know exactly where London landed in, in the novel, but certainly in the movie, you don't get any easy answers, do you? No, no. And, and, and I, you know, I, I, I think that that's a filmmaker who has not only lived through Italian history, but the history of Italian movies. Um, during the neorealist phase, and, and there are touches of neorealism yes. you know, in the early part of this movie, um, what ha what was happening in Italy um, right after the war um, was that all, almost to a man, and they were all men, uh, the film critics were communists. Um, I, Paul Miro, Tolly, 
Holiati, I, I forget his name, was going to, if there was an honest election, he would have won. And, you know, the communist guy who, you know, who'd fought the Nazis and the, you know, the um, resistance was going to win. Um, Toliati, I think his name was. Um, and then the United States step, stepped in and with the Vatican formed the Christian Democratic Party um, and, and just love bombed Italy um, with a lot of aid and this and that and the other. And they had a, they had a plan B, which was actually had assassinations and things in it. Um, but when the vote happened, Togliatti didn't win and the kind of more moderate Christian Democrats kind of held on to that power for the next, you know, 80 years or whatever it was. Um, but in that film world, there were, you know, we know some of the more kind of um, emotional ones. There were a lot of really, really didactic um, communism is the answer, socialism is the answer. Well, that was 1949, 1950, 1951. Obviously it didn't work for Italy. It wasn't the answer <laughs> for them. Um, and so this filmmaker I think is, is trying to avoid that, that ending, that socialist realistic ending with you know the low low cam camera angle and people with their fists raised, right? Um, it just it it didn't work out. Um, so he's he's stuck. I'm you know I'd love to see what he's going to do with his next film to see if he's moved on from that. But this is a film where I think he sees some of the conflicts within Jack London um, in the book, and he said, "Okay, you want conflicts? <laughs> you know, here's what I'm going to do with it." Well, and here's the thing when, when I think I, I think I heard about this like a year ago that, you know, that a, that a film about Jack London was, you know, from about Martin Eden yeah. uh, was was, was going to be coming out. And, and I thought, OK, great, because that would be, a, you know, a film for the Labor Film Festival. But I remember thinking, like, it's just not something that springs to mind as a Jack London. You know, it's an interesting mm -hmm. choice, yeah. uh, particularly these days. And so I guess what are your thoughts about? why and I, I obviously go read and see it. I'm sure the directors talked about it but for yourself as a filmmaker and seeing this film and having read the novel mm -hmm. you know in in the moment where we are at this point what what do you think would be attractive about you know taking on I mean it's, it doesn't have a happy ending it doesn't have a a clear message and you know mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he couldn't have gotten a finance in the United States. I'll tell you. <laughs> Speaking from um, personal experience, right, John? Yeah. Um, I think some of it is, you know, here's this guy who is smart, really smart, absolutely uneducated because of class. And he, he actually kind of eventually is much more educated than the kind of bourgeoisie people who he, he wants to fit in with at first. Um, and, and kind of looks down on them into intellectually later, but he's wrestling with big ideas. Mm -hmm. And except for a few incidents, um, they remain abstract, big ideas. Yes. And I, I think some of what the interest is, is the big ideas, if they stay abstract, don't really work for us. Don't work for anybody. Um, if you stop, if you, if you start saying, no, this is the way it has to be. This is what communism has to be. This is what capitalism has to be. These are the rules and stop being among the people to see if it's working out for them. It doesn't work. Mm. And, and, and these ideas, he grabs onto these ideas and eventually he grabs onto, I think it's uh, mostly Nietzsche and Spencer and they're they're very much you know survival of the fittest people, mm -hmm. um, and and Jack London had a whole streak in them where from his observation, you know he lived in some pretty rough places. That's who survived, um, and and not necessarily the nicest right. or even the smartest. You know, right. it was often the most ruthless. I mean, uh, Alaska when he was up there um, had. Uh, in the early days of the gold rush, there were no lawyers, there were no judges, it wasn't even <laughs> territory yet. So when there were hangings, they were because a bunch of miners got, gold miners got together and said, this guy's jumping claims, we hate him, let's lynch him. And that wow. was law. 
you know, and, and sometimes, you know, as they say, he needed killing and other times, well, maybe not so much. So there are a couple of things I just wanted to uh, throw out and get you read. One of the uh, interesting characters that I really, maybe I was just looking for somebody that I could sort of, uh, the, mm-hmm. the poet, mm-hmm. the poet, uh, and, and again, it's been a while since I read the novel, mm-hmm. so I don't know, you know, if, if he had as much of a role in the novel or whether it was brought out more. And I wonder if that was a way, a, a bit of an answer there, you know, somebody, because he really did seem to have a, a piece of, of, of something that, that London was maybe looking for. Yeah, uh, in, in the book, he's an important character who, um, who, who has written this wonderful kind of epic poem mm. and, and, but is so discouraged by that literary world that he says, well, I, I like it. I put my, my soul into it, but I don't want it published. <laughs> and then when he dies, Martin Eden has it published and it becomes a literary sensation. So it's, it's a guy, you know, it, it, it's one thing to write. Um, you know, I, I wanted to write cause I wanted to write. I didn't know any writers. I didn't want to be a writer. You know, I'd never seen a writer on a talk show even, you know, I saw Norman Mailer before I even knew he was a writer. I thought he was some kind of, you know, performer. Um, he was. But, yeah. But, but, you know, basically this is a guy who his, his reason for wanting to write is status and is to move up in class and, you know, and money happens to come with it when he, he nails it. Um, so, so the writing itself doesn't mean what it should to him anymore. Whereas that character, at least in the book, you know, um, the older guy, the writing's what's important. You don't even have to publish it. J.D. Salinger's, he wrote for 30, 40 years and just said, well, I'm not really at the point where I need to publish anymore. And who knows, maybe the stuff was great, maybe it wasn't, but he kept writing, you know? And, and, and I think it was because very much like Jack London, he had this early incredible success and and it was like a, a weight. It was like a thing that he just didn't want to deal with again. So he just decided, if I don't do the publishing, I feel great about the writing. I don't have to worry what anybody thinks of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to me, what's too bad about that is, you know, unfortunately, that that kind of literary machine is between you and your readers. Right. And, and what you don't really see either in the book or in the movie is that there are these readers who, who you know, they may have to read it for, there's a great um, quote, um, uh, Harry Cruz, who died a couple years ago, um, he, he was like, his parents were just about illiterate. Um, you know, he was a sharecropper's kid and he wrote his first novel and uh, he gave it, you know, a little thin novel uh, to his mom and his mom called him a week later because he said she wore those words off the page because she didn't read that well. And she, she said, Harry he says, yeah, those people who paid you for that book. He said, yeah, mama he said, do they know it's not true? <laughs> and he said, that's called fiction mama. And she said, well, as long as they know, you know, that, you know, Harry Cruz was a guy who was always, he, he, he wished the people he wrote about and grew up with read books. And there was always that little bit of a, well, I'm going to write for them, even if they never read me. Wow. A couple of other things before we wrap up. I found myself, and, and I don't know why, maybe you, can, maybe you can solve this for me. I found myself thinking about uh, a one of my favorite London novels, which was for a long time was hard to find, uh, The Iron Hill, mm-hmm. uh, which is about um, communist organizing in a Ford factory, also does not end well, uh, by the yeah. way. <laughs> um, it, it didn't sure. end well in the Ford factory until um, Roosevelt got in. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, but I just found myself thinking about that book. Um, 
yeah, while I was watching this, and it was maybe because I was resonating more with sort of some of the political stuff, you know, when when he was kind of putting it together. But I don't your your thoughts on on that? Yeah, I think I think you know when when you write a book that's about stuff in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, Usually, the better books are the ones where you're still trying to work it out. Uh huh. You 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 don't know all the answers, and certainly at the time that he wrote the Iron Heel, the the jury was out. This stuff right. may work, it may not work, it may turn out well, it may not turn out well. Um, so he's working something out there, and it's much more concentrated. And oh, there, yeah. it, it is not about a tortured soul, um, who who you know. The, the guys who are trying to organize in that Ford factory are not trying to escape their class. Right. They're trying to improve their lives and the lives of everybody around them. And, and the everybody is the important part of that. Um, so it's a much more concentrated book in a way. Um, and I think he was less depressed when he wrote it. <laughs> um, let's just say, you know, uh, once again, he didn't have what happened to the labor movement. He didn't right. know what was going right. to happen to it. You know, this is this is like Knights of Labor days. This is not even you know the AFL CIO. No, yet. no. So these are these are very new, very um, and the American version. Once again, the American version is the Wobblies, which right. is one big union. It's not about skilled workers. Um, you know, having a a class difference from unskilled workers. It's about we're all in this together. And it, it's the homegrown version of the kind of syndicalism that came over from Europe and, and mm-hmm. tended to be more factory workers and immigrants, um, you know, kind of east of the Mississippi. Right. Yeah, no, I think I think you nailed it exactly. Um, the last thing I want to ask you about is, you know, as I'm always curious, um, you know, as a filmmaker, mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know if you, you if you watch a lot of movies, if you or if you do, what kind you watch. Uh, so I'll just throw out that that you know I do watch a lot of films, and I'm, I'm mm-hmm. and especially with a and there's a lot of good stuff going on out there, mm-hmm. um, obviously, um, but there's a lot of stuff uh, that is that is just really predictable and mm-hmm. and you know not not great filmmaking, not great mm-hmm. storytelling. And this one, even even you know, although I was, as you very well point out, pulled. I mean, I, mean, I wanted mm-hmm. that, that. Um, but I was just really, I was just mesmerized by the filmmaking, and really, mm-hmm. in a way that you really want to be when you go to. I mean, and hopefully soon when we can go back it, into it the theater. A, it is not a predictable movie. No, no, uh, and he's not a predictable guy. And there, and it's kind of a shock when you see him after his success. You know, of all, oh I was going to recognize him. Yeah, what went on with this guy? Um, and he wants you to have that shock. I mean, that's a that's a choice. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's generally a lot easier to make something predictable. Um, many people go to a movie for comfort, not to be challenged. All uh, right. You know, and if you're going for comfort, you want it to be a little different than the last one you've seen, with a couple twists and turns that are different, but you you really want to feel like you know, um, the good guys are going to win or, you know, whatever it is that you go in there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you have to hand it to him there is he, he, you know, somehow he got this thing made and uh, it is not predictable. And, it, and even if you read the book, it's not predictable. You know, he took it and said, here's what I'm going to do with it. This is what it has inspired within me. Yeah. It, it, and it, it just, uh, it's exciting to see that kind of filmmaking, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. You know, what, what, one thing that I, I think neither the, the book or the, the movie get into, um, which is um, if you're a sailor, mm-hmm. you are on one of the most cast aware rank level kind of structures yes. in the world. Yes. And it's almost like the minute we, we leave dock, you know, we have a king not just a president, we have a king. Um, you know, you, you read Billy Budd and some of those things and, and it's just like, well, that's God. You know, that, that's the metaphor that, that Melville is working on in, in Billy Budd is Billy Budd is actually, you know, when he says, God bless Captain Veer at the end, he's saying, 
God does terrible things, but I believe in him. You know, That's right. What could be more classist than that? You know, well, uh, and we should leave. We should we should end up as a good place because you are. Uh, I highly recommend Yellow Earth, John's last novel. Mm-hmm. It's a great read. Um, but you have just been working. Uh, I think you said you had just finished your new one, which is. No, related- no, I, I wrote that. Yeah, you know, I had that done a year ago before COVID. It just takes a long time to find a publisher. So I'm just working on the editing right now. But I have a, a new novel called Jamie McGillivray, which um, starts at the Battle of Culloden and ends at the Battle of Quebec. And uh, you're taken from the highlands of Scotland to dungeons in London down to the Georgia colony, uh, sold up the river by the Shawnee to the Lenny Lenape, or known as the Delaware Indians. And the main character is a linguist. So he ends up being the translator for a tribe who are deciding, okay, it's the French and Indian War. Do we go with the French or do we go with the British? And so it touches a lot of bases. Cannot wait to read it. All right. So, uh, do we do we have a what, do we have an idea when that'll be coming out? I think it'll be a year before they can spit it out. Um, oh wow. Okay. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. Old. Yeah. John Sales, wonderful as always to talk to you. Can't wait to get you back in the theater. Thanks so much for spending time with us tonight. Really appreciate it. Right. Thanks for for hanging in, everybody. All right. Take care. Bye now. Mm-hmm.